So as I am sure many of you have heard and now seen, Cyberpunk 2077 reviews are here. Many press outlets as well as YouTubers were able to get their hands on the game a few days ago and able to compile first impressions slash reviews of their experience. And of course, the thing people always say when looking at reviews for higher profile products like this is to never just look at one of them. Always look at, consume, and read several different reviews, compare the experiences of many. And considering I'm sure most of you may have not done that because who wants to spend the better half of a day reading reviews from various outlets? Instead, I did. I spent nearly all day reading some of these new reviews and watching some of the videos made on them and compiled a comprehensive or ultimate review, taking some of the complaints and criticisms we saw consistently and some of the features that were more of a mixed bag, with some reviewers actually criticizing features that others didn't have a problem with. So this will hopefully give you a much more comprehensive but true to form review of the game game, give you a better idea of what this game actually is, not just one player's impression. I'll have links to all of the reviews down below as well as timestamps in this video for the different sections, two of the very notable ones being combat and the length of the game, as those were two aspects to have a lot of discussion and even disagreement. But one of the first things that I think is very important to establish is the nature of these reviews, the characteristics by which they were created, which is something I don't think nearly enough of these outlets actually highlighted as there are interesting limits limitations or NDAs slash embargoes around the reviews. And a great write-up is actually by SkillUp, somebody who did receive a review code. So right off the bat, no console review codes were provided. None of these reviews are on console. Every single one was conducted on PC. And even further, no footage is able to be shared yet. Although the review embargo has lifted, the gameplay embargo hasn't. That seemingly is coming early on Wednesday. Although several outlets were able to actually post screenshots they had taken during their experiences. So we do have some images of things like bugs or features. And potentially one of the most important considerations, the vast majority of these people have only had the game for five to six days. So when looking at a larger scale game like Cyberpunk, it's important to remember that these guys had to kind of grind to some degree. As some reporting 40 hours of playtime across six days, that's a lot of hours per day and could definitely impact an experience. But with that said, let's start looking at the reviews themselves and what people first thought about the overall story experience, but of course, without any spoilers just their impressions of the story content itself. The prologue is described as doing an incredible job of introducing you to the character and world overall. It really motivates you to continue looking into and solving the problem created for V. The story itself goes places you wouldn't really expect. One of the aspects of this game that was consistently discussed in the reviews are the different tones of it, including the responses from V around those tones. Sometimes V will come across as likable and mature, but other times she'll switch back to being almost like an angsty teen and darker. But also from quest to quest, whether it be the main quest or even mostly on some of the side quests, things would go from funny to extremely dark. And although there were funny and more joyful moments, overall the game was definitely described as being one with heavy dark content. There are a lot of evil people doing evil things in this world. And not just like, oh, it's the mean boss of this big corporation, but it explores things like abuse and assault. And sometimes you will see this. And this isn't only during the quest, some reviewers describe spotting things like S assault taking place on the streets of Night City. You just kind of stumble upon it. And this was actually something that was met with some criticism more than once. And what was described was not necessarily that it shouldn't be covering or looking at these particular things, but rather it just didn't always have a deeper meaning or purpose. The game wasn't providing meaningful commentary on it. It was just featuring edgy content. And at points, some of the extreme sexuality felt like it really didn't have much of a point. And to be clear, that was from several different reviews, not just one review said that, but those opinions weren't universal. Some others felt that the game, although having many, many dark points, also oftentimes provided a silver lining to you, so you could see the happier side of Night City. The story itself was described as having many cliffhangers, those story missions would leave off on a reveal or something drawing you in wanting to do whatever was next, and at numerous points, many reviewers described how the major story beats would hit in a profound way and kept the reviewer interested and in continuing to play. Although it doesn't seem like the main story was actually one of the main appeals. Some people thought it was good, but not the best part of the game. Saying some of the side content was actually a bit better, not that the main story was bad, but that the side content could at points outshine it. One reviewer described getting very little out of the story, how the ending felt disjointed from the type of character they were trying to play, so almost a failure from a role-playing perspective, and they didn't get the point that the world was trying to say, although this was definitely the outlier 
are not the rule. As some of the reviewers described loving nearly every single job they completed in this game. Although one of the other criticisms of this was that although many cultures are showed to you all throughout Night City, you'll see a lot of very cool and interesting things and get tidbits of information on them. A lot of times you couldn't actually get too deep into the background of them. One example given was trying to find out the nature of the name of the Voodoo Boys. There was a couple of lines on this. It looked like there'd be something deeper, but that reviewer didn't find anything after beating the game. It was a bit more on the surface level as far as some of those cultures went. But also a complaint that was seen was that it often felt like there was almost two different characters with V. When doing the main story, you were more locked down, kind of having to go down a certain path and character. But during the side quest, able to open up more, there's more choices and you could more accurately describe who you wanted to be or rather who this reviewer was trying to betray. But overall, the story at its core is V not wanting to die. And that was something very easy to connect to and understand the motivation of. And although there was some disagreement, many felt that you were able to really represent your character in the choices and provide a really satisfying arc for your character given the choices across an entire game. And given choices, it seems like there's an insane amount of those. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but many talk about doing something, then going back to try different avenues and getting completely different outcomes. Several reviewers described that what if scenario, reloading a past save and going down a different avenue and being pleasantly surprised with what they found. Although as far as the length of this game overall, this is another one where we got some mixed responses, but hopefully this video can serve to holistically look at them a bit better. It seems like the main story is going to be roughly 15 to 25 hours. It seems like 15 is really beelining it, 25 is more taking your time, so an average of about 20 hours to beat the main story alone. This was shorter than expected, and I think a lot of people may be surprised by that number, but the content variations and the side content are the insane part here, because even though it may take you 20 hours to beat the main story, many reviewers felt like they barely scratched the surface of the game overall, with one describing that there was at least 35 to 40 hours of side quests alone. One person did say, after 50 hours with the game, they had completed the main story and had very few side missions left. But then conversely, in a different review, somebody said after 50 hours, they did the main quest and beat the game, but still had plenty to do. Still a ton of gigs left undone, as well as fixers regularly calling for help, and of course, things like collecting items. And another thing consistently repeated throughout these reviews was that focusing in on beelining the main story or just trying to beat it in 20 hours was a massive mistake. And one of the more concrete examples was how beelining the story led to just three endings. But then, as that reviewer reloaded and did a bunch of side missions and a bunch of other optional jobs, they ended up actually getting several endings in total, up from the original three, and as well as numerous extras and additional choices all along the way. The side content here really does have a huge impact. You have a ton of control as a player on how things will play out by which jobs you choose to do and even sometimes how you choose to do a job. And it is regularly described how different players could have widely different outcomes. And even on the topic of those different endings, it seems like this was actually kind of similar to the intro life path, the life path part being about an hour of your prologue. The endings were not just a slideshow, it was actually a hour or so long experience depending on the ending you chose. So it was a decent chunk of different content for that ending. And overall, it seems like Cyberpunk 2077 has a different structure to other RPGs. You don't have to get deep into this game to have a ton of optional or side content. Very early on, it just throws a ton at you. Many of this handed to you via completing quests, some of it via exploration, and even some of these quests, you have to actually go to certain places to unlock them. They're not just hand-fed to you, you have to actually find them. The side content here is meaty and available right off the bat, right after you finish that prologue, which is about five to six hours in length. And these aren't minor. Side jobs are described as basically being campaign arcs in their own right. Some of these being quest lines where you're exploring a bit deeper into characters you met during the main story or others just being totally new ones. Oftentimes you will become very invested with characters you meet on side missions and it seems like these are quite lengthy experiences at points. Some can definitely be easy to miss but there's a lot of lore to also find and read along the way. It was emphasized so many times in these reviews how impactful and notable this 
side content was, even many calling it the best part of the game overall, some side quests being essential to the experience overall. And one of the interesting parts about this was, even though some of those meteor side stories were described as being pretty epic, even some of the more minor gigs that otherwise would kind of just be a fetch quest in other games were described as being really solid pieces of content in Cyberpunk and praised numerous times across reviews. This was something that actually really surprised me as that's typically more of a throwaway just filler content, but not here. The side content was consistently good from jobs small to large, but there was no big standout, said one reviewer. Nothing quite on the tier of a Bloody Baron quest, but again, overall, just really good content. One of the main criticisms being that it wasn't always clear which side missions would impact the main story. So you had a bunch of side missions in your journal, and some of these would be more minor, other ones being more full-fledged arcs, and it was hard to differentiate between them at times. One of the other parts of this game, to get consistent and plentiful praise was the characters of it. V herself is apparently a major character. You're an active participant in what is going on with this world and the evolution of it, but nearly all of the major characters you will encounter were described as being well acted and voiced, with many citing crazy detail on the body of some of these otherwise miscellaneous characters. This didn't apply to everyone in the world, but the big ones were definitely pretty notable, with some raising their praise even a bit more, saying the characters in this game are some of the best gaming has to offer. And it seems like the voice acting was extremely well done, not only in the English version, but also at least in the German version. One of the big compliments of character interaction was how, when you're conversing with characters, they'll do other things. You yourself can walk around while in dialogue and actually look at your environment, but as you're talking to people, they might fidget, they might play with something, they might be eating or drinking. Apparently this made things feel very immersive and real. And even some of the characters are a bit less patient. There's sometimes a countdown timer on screen, but other times characters pressuring you to actually respond, and at points you could just not respond if you don't want to. Funny enough, despite characters overall getting a ton of praise and it pretty much being consistent praise, one aspect that did get more mixed reviews was Johnny Silverhand. Overall, he was described as being more dark and dangerous in his thoughts, but he does help shape the story, kind of being an anchor always there for the story, and having a consistent role throughout the main story and even some side quests. And although several did praise Keanu's performance, describing him as pretty much on par with several other characters being a notable one that you always wanted to hear from, whether you had good or bad advice to give, it was always interesting. Some others felt like he was actually outshined by some of the other characters and describe how he didn't really steal the show, and even some others going a bit harsher saying he had one of the weakest performances of the cast overall and being monotone at points. One of the specific complaints was around how, during the main quest, you're going to almost be converting or improving Johnny Silverhand potentially, depending on which dialogue you choose with him, you try and make him a better person, and although this will show results during the main quest, as you then took a step aside to do some side quests, he would immediately revert to how he was at the start of the game, like all of that progress was lost, likely due to which voice lines were already recorded. And some described with his character specifically that they were happy with how the relationship ended, where you ended up with him, but not always how you got there, the progress was at points a bit disappointing. Another aspect of this game to get near universal praise, which fortunately, actually several things got a lot of praise, is Night City itself, where this got some of the highest praise overall. Exploring Night City was simply described as amazing. Many reviewers described feeling bad using fast travel because of how beautiful this city is. And not even just beautiful, but both beautiful and vile. Some of the best moments described is just driving around Night City in your car and taking it all in, whether it be the good sides, the dark sides, or even just the atmosphere itself. There won't be another open world like this for a long, long time. The scale of the city was basically unprecedented and unmatched in any other game. They were able to achieve what Rockstar has with their past games, with the scale and the intricacy of this city, and exploring it was just a dream. One of the most interesting compliments how Night City felt like a living screensaver that you were just taking in. Although this definitely did have some complaints also, not so much with Night City itself, but with the people who inhabited it. Not those major characters I talked about previously, but just miscellaneous NPCs. These guys got very little praise at all. It seems like at points they were just wonky, like sometimes a reviewer would walk up to something and see repeated NPCs. It's unclear if that's a bug or a feature though. At one point a reviewer says he walked up to a rave in the Badlands and saw three sets of triplets, that just being one NPC that was copied and pasted three times. Sometimes you would see miscellaneous NPCs doing things like sitting on a couch playing a banjo, except you'd see them all over Night City, just the same guy were copy and pasted all about. And one of my favorite descriptions, one reviewer described the NPCs like a giant zombie army on their way to work, but if you bumped into one, they would all immediately 
immediately run away when you get some stars and actually compare them to the quality of GTA 3 and PCs. But speaking of driving, this too had a couple of comments and notes on it. There's a variety to choose from and even some more unique or special vehicles you'll get during missions. It seems like you will constantly be offered to buy cars or just given cars by completing the main story. And similar to what we heard in past reviews, it does seem like driving could use some work. At points, it took a bit of getting used to and how the driving controls felt clunky. It never feels as if you're going as fast as you are, but it still feels amazing going through Night City at car, even though the driving could use a bit of work. This game first and foremost is described as feeling like a proper RPG with a plethora of choices to make. Not so much that flashy, quick gunplay you see in the marketing material, but rather more grounded and based on dialogue choices, and a lot of time was described being spent in menus, specking your character, or even crafting things. But crafting and items overall is another one that ended up being a bit of a mixed bag for some people. Right off the bat, the game has a ton of looting to do in different interiors you'll go through, and it's definitely there if you're interested. For better or worse, items in this game do have levels associated with them, so you have to get to a certain level to use it, but also it will become outdated. Although fortunately, when you unlock some cool items, it'll actually unlock the ability to craft it also, and you can upgrade things manually if you want to go that route to keep them relevant. One weird observation on this was, even though you could get a bunch of legendary or unique items, in 40 hours, the vast majority were either pistols or katanas. And for those collectors out there, some items you could get, some of these legendary unique items, do have custom display slots in your apartment, so you have a nice place to present that. That's really cool, and I think it's a nice attention to detail. Cyberware in particular is one of those cool things with the game that was pretty prohibitive, in that it was hard to actually purchase this, and you would definitely have to focus on doing side content if you wanted to be able to afford it. It was really expensive. But overall, it's described how, when you're immediately introduced to all the weapons, armors, and items in general, it's really exciting, but pretty quickly, you just start using what has the best stats. And oftentimes, you're found just wearing a goofy outfit because your stats are tied to outfits, and although what you're wearing may have the best stats, it may not look super good alternatively. But also, certain items have more mod slots, which was definitely appealing, and sometimes that was something to prioritize even over damage. But then moving on to combat more specifically, this was another one to get some pretty interesting responses. Stealth was simply described as the most fun thing to do in this game. Gunplay was fine, but just not nearly as engaging as darting around and using stealth tactics. Hacking and stealth together were really the two biggest praises in the combat sphere. Weapons overall were definitely praised. Weapons were described as having distinctive feels. Weapons versus melee definitely felt quite a bit different, but one of the big problems with combat seems to be the AI could be pretty dumb. They'll just run at you coverless, they don't stand behind cover at some points, and even they'll stand behind things that don't actually protect them. Many people found the AI to leave quite a bit to be desired, but it seems like perhaps stealth and just the AI never seeing you could make up for this at some points. Aggressive bosses and cyber ninjas were apparently the most difficult AI to deal with, people that would actually just bum rush you and attack you straight away. But also, apparently with combat, it gets way better the further you get into the game. Many people describe not necessarily being disappointed off the bat, but combat in the early game not being comparable to combat in the late game. Once you get some cybernetics, get some attributes, skills, and perks, combat really starts to take off. You start either dealing a ton of damage or really find that build you are looking for. So if you get cyberpunk and you find off the bat, you don't necessarily love the combat, perhaps it's just because you haven't put enough time into your character yet. But also, it seems like difficulty could be easy as a result of this. After specking your character, you can almost feel like an unkillable god. Just slice through enemies and literally one hit consistently. Some people describe killing 10 to 15 enemies in just a minute. And how at points, you could be flashy for the sake of it, using all of your abilities, quick hacking, sneaking around, but also at certain points, you were so specked out or at such an advantage, you could literally just run up to people and slice and dice if you didn't even want to go that route. Although this was kind of confusing because other people said how some enemies could just one-shot you, especially in the early game if you're facing higher tier foes. High level enemies will have a little red skull next to their name, and only one reviewer even even discuss the difficulty setting they played on. Playing on normal apparently just gave you way too many freebies, you'd have a ton of ammo at all times, never concerned about it, as well as aid and other crafting items. So perhaps this is a game where you actually think about immediately turning it up to some of the harder difficulties because normal definitely seems to hand you quite a bit. And although it seems many people did opt for stealth gameplay, it seems like every playstyle is at least somewhat catered for. All of the playstyles and weapon types felt fun, and people oftentimes describe switching between a few in the early game. And really enjoying the experience overall. You know that the shooting was somewhat of a mixed bag, it seems like one of the best examples that represents people and reviewers overall is that it performs closer to Call of Duty than Fallout, and reviewers were definitely surprised by how good the shooting could 
be at times. It definitely could have clunky moments also, but it was responsive, featured great animations, and combat just felt pretty fluid, with some of the higher praise actually being that combat and shooting specifically was some of the best in the RPG genre. Melee didn't get quite as much praise, which is interesting because in the previews it did get quite a bit of praise, but it was described even though there are several melee features like parries, blocks, counters, a lot of times you could just kind of swing away and don't even have to bother with those and you'd be absolutely fine. But again, perhaps this is tied to the difficulty these guys were playing on. Melee in general was compared to the melee we see in Bethesda games, being roughly the same quality. The visuals and sounds were another thing to get a lot of praise. This described as an absolutely beautiful game and even a game worth upgrading for. Although as far as performance, one outlet to actually get some review codes was Tom's Hardware. These guys oftentimes posting benchmarks and posting full-fledged benchmarks for Cyberpunk in its early access. This of course likely before the release drivers for Nvidia cards at least, but apparently this game can be kind of hard to run and they describe ray tracing as being really all or nothing. You need to have it maxed out or it doesn't make a significant difference, but when you do have it maxed out, it is really pretty. But if you want to play at 60 FPS and pull this off, it seems like you're going to need a top tier card, a 3080 or above. And it seems like this chart put out by CD Projekt in the past is actually targeting 30 to 40 FPS, which of course for PC players is pretty much a deal breaker. I don't know anyone that targets 30 FPS on PC. But even outside of that, some characters visually just have insane amounts of details. And even some of the rooms have layouts that are both beautiful to look at, but also are intricately detailed. Like several artists had to go over individual rooms to hand place everything. The third person perspective was definitely missed by some, especially in the early game, but they say as they play, it definitely got pretty adaptable and first person felt natural and immersive. One of the things to get a lot of praise that I was kind of surprised on was the sound of this game and how much the music and soundtrack actually added to the game overall. The soundtrack is described as emphasizing critical moments, and even some moments were made notable and memorable due to the soundtrack being so explosive and powerful in that moment. And even just the car radio, some people describe doing a quest driving all the way to the quest and sitting in their car for the song to finish because it was that good. Across the board, the soundtrack and music got a ton of praise, literally no criticism. And even some of the shorter reviews that didn't include so many details did take the time to include the soundtrack and music because it was that notable. Unfortunately, apparently one of the other notable parts of Cyberpunk is its bugginess. So there's been a ton of argument and debate online as to what the patching situation was with this build of the game. And it more or less seems for about half the time for most of these reviewers, they had a more updated version of the game. And then some seemingly didn't get a patch at all. But basically on late Thursday of last week, a day zero patch was sent out by CD Projekt. And they described to these reviewers how the day zero patch includes some of the fixes of the day one patch, but not all of them. And the day one patch will include additional fixes. But they wouldn't specify what those additional fixes were. And to one, they actually said that the other fixes would be mostly performance and stability focused. Looking at the reviews holistically, overall, people said this game was incredibly buggy, and most said it was to a fault. It took them out of key moments, they had crashing, they were forced to reload past saves. There were a couple of people saying they only had visual bugs, but that was the outlier. And even further, most people here did say that even after that Thursday patch, things were still really bad. It definitely seems like the consensus was there is no way the day one patch will solve all of this, especially considering they already have seen, or at least some of them have seen part of the day one patch, with one even making the powerful claim that they had not seen this many bugs in a game since Skyrim. As far as some of the bugs reported, because these are both kind of funny, but also something we may be seeing as we play for ourselves, you'd walk into a bar and just see a bunch of people T-posing. During one mission, someone could no longer aim down sights. They had to reload a past save to be able to aim again. Crashes at key story moments. One person actually had the same crash twice in a row while trying to complete a quest. They crashed reloaded, crashed again, and then had to take a step away. The frame rate just crashing or plummeting, where it would get really bad FPS and you'd have to relaunch the game. Wrong items being shown, and this one was kind of funny. At one point, Jackie was supposed to pull a biochip out of his head, but instead actually pulls a gun out of his head. At some points, items would just be invisible, disappear, not have textures, or again, show the wrong item, so somebody was holding the wrong thing. One reviewer describes having created a V that was a male character using a male voice, but as they were talking to somebody, the female voice just started playing for some of the dialogue, then it would switch back to the male voice. He said he was pretty sure that was a bug and not an intended feature. Sometimes when in dialogue with somebody, other dialogue would play. So sometimes you were talking to somebody and their passive lines would just start overlapping their actual in dialogue lines, or you were talking to somebody and you get a phone call and you
you couldn't stop it. So you would just have two people talking over each other. As you were sitting in a car driving, the camera would bob as if you were running. A lot of people reported just having missing hair when you looked in the mirror. After dying, one reviewer lost the ability to hack things. One of the funniest ones was somebody was doing a shooting competition. And during this competition, for some reason, a bunch of children spawned in front of him. You can't aim at children in cyberpunk, so he literally lost the competition because he couldn't aim down sights because the children prevented him from hitting the target. So although there's definitely a range of experiences here, it seems like the norm was people experiencing bugs, experiencing bugs on nearly every major quest or mission. It seems like it got worse towards the end of the game, and a couple even had the more extreme opinion of saying the game should be delayed again. Now, of course, it is definitely worth considering. This doesn't mean that the game will be buggy on release. It, I mean, it definitely makes it seem like it is very likely it'll be buggy on release, but technically they were playing without the full day one patch. But in fact, for some, if not most of these reviewers, they had a partial patch for some of their review. I've seen a few people online trying to downplay the bugginess or citing reviews where they experienced no bugs, but again, I want to reiterate here, that was the outlier. The vast majority of these reviews describe quite a few bugs and very frustrating bugs. Sometimes they were just visual or not necessarily crashing your game outright or didn't block progress altogether, but they were so critical like a character just T-posing as you're at a critical story focused moment that it totally took you out of it. Or again, that bug with Jackie taking a gun out of his head instead of the biochip. That is kind of hilarious, but if you're getting serious and immersed in the game, that would be quite immersion breaking. Although even despite that, the overall opinions of this game were glowing. People absolutely loved it. Despite the bugs, or even with the bugs, it was still a remarkable RPG, a decade-defining game. It doesn't necessarily try a ton of new things, but it's a clear refinement on what other RPGs have attempted, and it does it really, really well. When this game comes together, when everything meshes perfectly, it feels like a truly unparalleled experience. At points, it definitely felt like it had shaky legs, like things could stop working, but overall, even though this will likely have some bugginess on release, it's seems like this game lived up to the hype somehow, which is incredible. I mean, we'll hear more concretely once gamers get it in their hand, but at least for reviewers and even with their review score alone, this is universally praised. Basically every single review I looked at had a ton of good things and almost exclusively good things to say outside of bugginess. So overall, hopefully you guys found this one informative. I find videos like this, even just personally to watch, pretty helpful. You never know what you're going to get with one reviewer or another, but having a ton of reviews all together typically gives you a more representative sample, a better idea of what people are actually thinking of this game. I still have yet to receive a review code for myself. I've sent out a few last ditch emails, so perhaps I'll have some earlier content for you. If not, I'll probably just do a live stream on the day of release. But with that said, as always again, I thank you all for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this again, and I hope to see you all next time. Later.